The Torture Garden is a nauseating yet resplendent novel. Its political and philosophical metaphor fused with sexual horror. Better than food, man. Good. Good. <laughs> <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Strange sounds coming from my street. Good morning, everyone. It's a beautiful day. Real beautiful morning here in Los Angeles. I can't think. I've been I've been up since like four thirty or five. Well, let's get to it. I hope you're all doing very well. I'm very excited. This one is a long time coming. It's been recommended by many, many, many people. Uh, Octave Mirbeau's The Torture Garden. Thrilled to have finally gotten to this. It's awesome. So let's get to it. One evening, some friends were gathered at the home of one of our most celebrated writers. Having dined sumptuously, they were discussing murder. Apropos of what, I no longer remember. Probably apropos of nothing. And so it starts in this traditional manner of narrative storytelling by this man at the dinner table who's seen it all and, you know, thousand yard stare, desperately wishes that he hadn't. Mirbeau was a very famous turn-of-the-century French playwright and novelist who wrote Diary of a Chambermaid, which was actually turned into a film by Louis Bunuel. He was an intense guy, falling out of favor with the church at a very young age. He was also at one point an opiate addict and served in the army and became disillusioned with the absurdity of war. And in his lifetime was involved in at least 12 duels, some of them due to his opinion as a journalist, which was his primary vocation. If truth were a woman, begins the introduction to The Torture Garden by the author Tom McCarthy. He makes compelling comparisons between the loose narrative of The Torture Garden and another venture into unknown lands, Heart of Darkness, and also brings up the notion that this novel precedes the thoughts and writings of my own patron saint, Georges Bataille. And so I'll build on those two comparisons to give you a quick and dirty reductive description of The Torture Garden. It's essentially Heart of Darkness written by Georges Bataille and edited by J.K. Wiesmal. Our woman, Clara, the woman who reveals a hideous truth to the anonymous protagonist, who thought that he was a debaucherous man to begin with, is equal parts Simone from Story of the Eye and Colonel Kurtz. Mirbeau wrote The Torture Garden kind of later in his life after he had become completely disillusioned with French politics and society on the whole. Probably the world, maybe life itself. As many of his novels, this one included and the ones after it, began to distance themselves from realism. Even though it's an obvious political critique of colonialism, certainly a heavy uppercut to the ideals and pretensions of Europe at that time, it operates on so many levels I could never give it that reductive description alone. At the same time, it is definitely not a glorification of foreign cultures or a cry for pacifism. Very far from it. Rather, the torture garden seems to say, look, don't shut your eyes, allow yourself to see, and know your own corruption, know that you're inherently guilty. Then tear away, strive for relief and peace. But know the cycle will always continue and you'll never escape. So of course, in a way you have these religious undertones. While masquerading as an embryologist to evade his circle of corrupt politicians, our protagonist meets a young, wealthy woman on a boat named Clara. And over the course of their journey to China, back to what becomes the origin of his and the world's corruption, he becomes infatuated with her. This is from the introduction by McCarthy again. That the narrator's trip to the Far East is presented to the French government and public as a scientific journey is no accident. Like philosophy itself, it is a quest for knowledge. And this is where philosophy, knowledge, horror, and obsession, sexual obsession, converge. He discovers that she is infinitely more corrupt and perverse than he is. Yet there's something about her that's beautiful at the same time, but malicious. A woman who is in love with the mingling of torture with horticulture, blood with flowers. Like McCarthy posits in the beginning, Clara is this metaphor for life. Truth itself and their relationship plays out in the torture garden, which could just be seen as the world. Nature is an orgy of entropic materiality. The excrement and blood of the tortured and the organic debris the crowd throws them is turned in redding vats into a fertile compost which is scattered on the plants, making them vigorous and beautiful, line from the book. 
and the plants in turn provide a setting for the torture, generating more blood, excrement, and debris. A perfect little ecosystem. It's beautiful, but it's disgusting, right? It's just, I mean, even in its translation, you know, I, I need to learn French so I can really get a feel for Mirbeau's use of language, but I mean, like, even in its translation, it still works so well. And that's often the case with a lot of French novels, especially like 20th century stuff that I've read. I mean, the translations, I mean, it's fine. Uh, but I wonder if it would be even better, you know, truly better uh, in the original language, probably. But Time, man. And McCarthy goes on further to make a comparison to J.G. Ballard's Crash, which is another novel that I love. One of my favorites, a novel you can actually feel. Also strikingly visual in its execution, painful and fascinating, with the cold clinical descriptions of all the different ways the soft human body can be molded and sculpted by a car crash. In this case, instead of twisted metal and broken glass, it's an exploration into the body's relationship with the devices of torture, juxtaposed, again, with the organic beauty of flowers. Described in gushing excess like the narrator of uh, Wiesmann's Against Nature. For example, to the right there were flowering lawns, to the left more shrubbery, pink acers rubbed with pale silver, bright gold bronze or red copper, mahonia whose leaves of reddish brown copper were broad as the leaves of the coconut palm, eleagnus which seemed to have been coated with polychrome lacquer, pyrus powdered with mica, laurel on which there twinkled and glittered the thousand facets of a variegated crystal, caladium whose veins of old gold set off the embroidered silks and pink lace of the blossom, arbor vitae, both blue, mauve, silver, and plumed with sickly yellows and poisonous orange. And it goes on and on. So, you know, it's like the violence is not exploitative. It's described uh, in parallel with the flora and the fauna, with all of these organic processes taking place naturally in this garden and it's it's kind of comparing those two cycles right comparing the cycle of violence and cruelty with the cycle of growth and decay naturally and right it's like it's so hard to 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 concisely articulate why that works or why it makes sense. It's almost, you know, in the back of the mind. It's kind of back here. It's like intuitive. It's like, ah, yes. And that's what I love about novels like this. It's like, you know, these extreme juxtapositions or contrasts which just work and you really don't know why. Yeah, it's, it's disgusting and horrifying. It's definitely got a little bit of, you know, 120 days of Sodom, but I mean, it's not nearly as uh, explicit for the sake of being explicit. It's not trying to shock you, really. It's, it's more satire than it is horror. I'll say that. It's more satire than it is horror. Kind of. It's still pretty horrifying. It's hard to describe, obviously. I'm kind of like at a loss for words. I love it. I think it's a, I think it's a magnificent novel. Being perfect artists and ingenious poets, the Chinese have piously preserved the love and holy cult of flowers, one of the very rare and most ancient traditions which has survived their decadence. And since flowers had to be distinguished from each other, They've attributed graceful analogies to them, dreamy images, pure and passionate names, which perpetuate and harmonize in our minds the sensations of gentle charm and violent intoxica intoxication with which they inspire us. So it is that certain peonies, their favorite flower, are saluted by the Chinese according to their form or color. By these delicious names, such as an entire poem or an entire novel, the young girl who offers her breasts, or the water that sleeps beneath the moon, or the sunlight in the forest, or the first desire of the reclining virgin, or my gown is no longer all white because in tearing it the sun of heaven left a little rosy stain, or even better this one, I possessed my lover, 
in the garden. It's almost kind of like a history lesson. I don't know if that's true. If it is, that's incredibly fascinating. Maybe it was at one point, maybe it's changed, but I think that's amazing if it is um, that you could, you could name species of flowers like that. I mean, it makes total sense. Um, it's a classic in transgressive fiction. Mirabeau perfectly captures the essence of wanting to go where you know you absolutely should not but can't help yourself. The turn of the century disenchantment spills out over the pages in this parodic, almost Grand Guignol style. Like this passage that recalls this doctor who's basically a, you know, uh, Jack the Ripper fashioned materialist. Ah, poet! Poet! exclaimed my father, who was not interested for a moment in the masterpieces which carried me away with enthusiasm when they're, they're at this museum. Art! Art! Beauty! Do you know what it is? Well, my boy, it is a woman's abdomen open and all bloody with the hemostats in place. Like McCarthy writes, murderous materialism that collapses concepts into writhing flesh. In spite of the horror, of course, in spite of being introduced to this hell on earth, our narrator, this anonymous guy who's trying to escape one hell and finds himself in another, can't extract himself from his fascination and his devotion to Clara. There's one particular line that stuck out to me and it's, it's like, you know, it's almost too much. It's almost like, ugh, but it works. I love it. And it's, uh, and I came back to her like an assassin returns to the very scene of his crime. And it might not work, you know, uh, extracted like that, but in the, in the context of the story, I thought that line was great. And I came back to her like an assassin returns to the very scene of his crime. While it doesn't make sense, while the narrative doesn't make sense, it stimulates all the senses, right? I love when you can do things like this in novels. It seems you can only do things like this in novels. You can conjure an image, blood and flowers, and, and, it, and you can have it bloom from there into whatever form it takes and whatever path it walks. A novel is like a garden of rotting, blooming flowers. Some stay and go and everything falls into one another, pollinating and consuming and working as this disturbing organic mechanism that plays out in time. It's incredible. There's nothing like the novel and there's nothing like the torture garden. So for those who like the authors I've mentioned, especially Bataille and Wiesmont, but also for lovers of Heart or Darkness or even something like Perfume by Patrick Zuskind, The Torture Garden is to die for. All right, I'll stop. I recently took a trip to the Museum of Death here in Los Angeles, surprisingly packed on a Saturday afternoon. Something I do recommend for those who find themselves on Sunset Boulevard with 45 minutes to kill. Mm -hmm. It's this giant collection of odd memorabilia related to serial killers. Not just that, they have all kinds of things related to death, but that's, that's some of the most interesting stuff. So they have, you know, paintings by Richard Ramirez and, uh, you know, the clown shoes of John Wayne Gacy. That was particularly disturbing to me, the painted polka dot clown shoes. Mm. And the actual head of the French serial killer who was, I think, the inspiration for Bluebeard, uh, Henri Desir. Landreau. I'm probably butchering that, but he's butchered plenty, so fuck him. But why I bring that up is it's easy to discern the similarities between wandering around that place and this book. And sure enough, there was a collection of very old Chinese executions, beheadings, and tortures. Like this book itself, the museum is certainly not for everyone. However, by the end of being witness to all these outrageous and often unique ways to shuffle off this mortal coil, you have this strange appreciation for being alive. I believe that is what Mirbeau was seeking to communicate, right? Life in all its horror and glory. And he succeeds tremendously. So like it says here on my Museum of Death mug, have a great life and always remember that it's far too short to read bullshit. I'll end on my favorite line from the book that is simple and profound. It's perfect. It's not dying that's sad. It's living when you're not happy. Better than food, man. Please subscribe, and if you enjoyed this, you can support the show by going to patreon.com forward slash books are better than food, where you can check out my private vlog, and you can see all the updates behind the scenes over here. Turns out I'm moving again. I just got here, and I love this view, and I love this place, but man, there's a lot of stuff going on, and uh, you can... Find out all about it if you 
go and check it out on Patreon. But uh, I am moving, and I will let you know where soon enough. Hope you guys are doing very well. Great to see you, of course. Check out Mirbeau's The Torture Garden. Stop by the Museum of Death. Get that coffee. Take care of yourselves. I'll talk to you soon. Have a good one. Ciao.